And I think that's something that I struggled with in the church is that everybody wants to talk to me about, Ira, you're so good at speaking, you can preach, you can do this, you can sing, da 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 da. And I'm struggling with stuff behind doors and nobody's talking to me about it. Wow. So I'm looking at these young guys and I'm thinking, you look at me as a role model. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm dealing with at this point in time. So I had to get to a place where I was just like, okay, well, God, you need to help me through this so I can help them through what they're going through. Welcome back, Dan, Patrick and Ira, professional footballer, fashion designer, author of this incredible book, which I really like, by the way. It looks awesome. Did you design this? No, I had a designer do that for me. Wow. Well, it's incredible. <laughs> and um, you also mentor young, young guys. Yes. Uh, how, why, do you, why do you and how do you find time to do that with everything else that's going on? I think uh, most of my life is based around purpose um, and everything I do is to change the world for God. So whatever God can put in my hands and whatever I'm gifted in or whatever I have a burden for, um, God gives me the capacity, which is something I've learned over the years um, to do with the mentoring. I've had a burden for young men ever since I was a young man and didn't have anybody to look up to in that sort of sense. And I noticed that there was a problem and I'm usually people look up, somebody that people look up to. And um, I thought, well, if I'm struggling with this stuff and they look up to me, then what are they struggling with? So I thought there's only one way to really deal with that issue, which is obviously get right myself, but also use that, what I've written in the book to help others as well. Yeah. And do you find that because you are a, a professional footballer, a little bit of fashion design, you are an author, do you think, does that help kids respect you and, and listen to you more? I think so, yeah. I think obviously being a professional footballer, I wouldn't have to be anything else for people to listen to me yeah, because yeah, they, right. just, they just see that title and, and automatically they're drawn to me, which I guess is, is God-given in a sense because I can use that platform for a good purpose. And uh, that's, that's the aim of what is a man and the mentoring program as well. Yeah. Fantastic. We're going to talk a little bit more uh, soon. Patrick, could you tell us a little bit more about mental health? I believe there's a pandemic of um, uh, mental health amongst young people. Uh, you do a lot of work with that. Tell us, what are, you, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's not only young people. I think, you know, we all have mental health the same way as we have physical health, right? It's, yes. on, a, it's on a continuum. And I think so often there's been stigma around mental health. But I think in the context of today, particularly for guys, you know, suicide, completed suicides, is the biggest killer of men between 40 and 49. And, uh, you know, 87% of rough sleepers will be blokes. Um, most runaways will be blokes. Wow. And, and there's some huge, huge issues around men's mental health. And, and you know, we have had this uh, culture, I guess, and I define culture as the way we do things around here. And there's this culture of man up, big boys don't cry. Yes. And how do we process our emotions? And, and so I really believe that the church is in every community across this country. And we have the best infrastructure there is. And uh, we were outlast politicians. And I feel we have a real important role to say, you know, what can we do to support people's mental health, particularly guys, but, but our community at the time. And I guess that's our heart in Kintsugi is to get alongside people. Yeah, that's amazing. Hey, Dan, if I was to say to you, man up, what, what, would, you, what would you say back to me? Do you think there's an issue? Is that, that, that term almost seems a little bit outdated now, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's just get over it. Stop being emotional. Don't pay attention to what you're actually dealing with. Just get over it. And if yes. you just suppress it, like you'll be able to deal with it that way. But what I'm finding, and it's just I'm no expert or doctor or anything, but just the people that just suppress it, it ends up building and building and building until later on in life, they just like have a breakdown and they just, you know, even the worst committing suicide. And so I think what it is by saying, like, I'm not going to man up. I'm going to man down. I'm going to process. I'm going to speak. I'm going to be vulnerable. We're going to be honest and open about where I'm at. What you're doing is you're going to get help with the hurt and the grief and the pain that you're facing, which will enable you to then move forward and, and be a, a better dad, be a better man. And so, um, yeah, I think next time someone tells you to man up, or, um, you know, when for me, when, uh, when I was dealing with something, when I was crying when I was younger, someone would say, oh, come on, don't be a girl. And, and back in the day, that was the biggest insult mm. to be called a girl because yes. what they're saying, you're emotional. Yes. But I think uh, now is the day where we can encourage men just to be okay with being their emotions. And it's going to feel really weird to be emotional with a friend. Like first time I sat with a friend and he cried and I cried, I got to be honest with you, it was really weird because we hadn't been brought up to do that. <laughs> but if you just embrace that, that vulnerability, um, great strength will come from it. Yeah. I think we can all... Yeah, if you've been on this planet more than five minutes, you can all be guilty of falling into that default of, you know, uh, like you said, don't cry like a girl. You know, it, but, but we know that now, um, thankfully, we're a little bit more educated than we, we were in the past. That, that, that's not the answer. Um, there's a lot of toxic, um, 
kind of toxic thinking around what it means to be a man, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, I mean, there's loads. And, you know, uh, the one thing I love about Ira's book is that he goes into the different layers. You know, we were just chatting earlier about one of them, which is always about how a man is this like workaholic. You work right. all the time because yep. you need to provide and you're expected to provide. Uh, and so if you're working all the hours and you haven't got family time to spend with your family, that's okay. Because as long as you're working, yes. that's okay. you don't need to spend time with your family. Mm. But actually, you know, if you're providing financially, and this is what Ira was telling me, this is what I come up with. Yes. But if you're providing financially, but you're not providing um, like your time and your presence and emotionally and being there for them, then are you really providing at all? And so I think there's so many layers of toxic masculinity, which I think we need to journey on together. Mm. The word that stands out for me is pride, and yeah. uh, the Bible has a lot to say about that. Patrick, haven't you, had, you, haven't you had some issues in your life that you've been through personally? Yeah, um, I think a number of years ago, I went through what I call the Tetris moment. Do you remember Tetris, the computer yes. game? Yes, mm. certain generation. <laughs> <laughs> and Tetris is a game where like, blocks fall out of the sky, and you rotate them, and you, you get them in a straight line, and once they're in a straight line, the line disappears, but the blocks just get faster and faster. And I just felt like I went through that time where everything went wrong at once. And uh, dad got cancer. I was in the hospital for nine weeks. I um, nearly died. I got diagnosed with massive um, degenerative knee problems, which I needed to have some serious operations. Kids got ill. You know, Diane had a miscarriage. Um, it just everything went wrong. And I really struggled with anxiety. And, uh, and yet the problem is, as a, as a Christian leader, I didn't tell anyone because I felt embarrassed and I felt ashamed. And I never heard it preached about on a Sunday morning. And when I did tell people, I was told, you just need to trust God a bit more. Huh. As if I'd never thought of that idea or, or pray a bit more. I've got a hidden sin or something. And, and you end up just, your self-esteem just starts to go, you know. And I realized that I was um, feeling this shame, you know, and people often say shame and guilt are very different things. Guilt is I've done something wrong. Shame is I start to believe I am wrong. And, uh, and you know, and at work, I was meeting the royals. We were doing lots of TV stuff, everything from the outside. The show reel looked brilliant. Hmm. But the behind the scenes was desperate. And I got to a place and I was like, I was so low. I remember thinking, I think my wife would be better off if I wasn't here now. Wow. And, and it's lonely and it's isolating. And, and so that's why I'm really passionate about having this conversation because it will save lives around what does it mean to step out of shame? Mm. You know, what does it mean to own your story? And, uh, and to realize that it's okay not to be okay. And actually to get help. That, to say that you need help is probably the most courageous thing that you'll yes. ever do. Mm. And, and we have to change the culture. And so for me, um, as I started talking about it, I just wrote books about it. I've got so many emails, people going, I've never heard anything from a Christian before that's so honest. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what are we talking about? 40% of the Psalms are laments. They're David crying out to God, yet holding the tension of faith at the same time. And so I often say to people that accepting the situation is different than resignation. It's different yeah. to say I quit. Yes. You need to accept it. Mm. Yeah. That's fantastic. What about success? I want to talk to you, Ira, about success. Uh, we have stereotypes of success, which I don't think helps us mm. as young men and certainly doesn't help us when we're um, fathering our, our children. You've made some quite bold decisions over the time about you know, what it means to be successful or not and step mm. back sometimes. Talk to us a little bit about what success means to you. I think for me, success is fulfilling what God has called me to do on this earth. Um, and I've always said to people, I had to get to the stage where football wasn't that important to me that I was going to give up purpose Amazing. for it. Um, and that was a big decision for me because, as you know, it's every young boy's dream to become a professional footballer. So on that journey, you wish to sacrifice whatever life brings because you want to achieve that goal. So I got to a point where I just, every time I prayed to God, all I was praying about was football. And God chastised me because he was like, do we actually have a relationship or am huh. I just a slot machine? Right. So I'm coming to God praying for this success, but he's showing me that that's not actually success. That's you just achieving a goal. So I had to sit back and I had to go, okay, God, I'm going to give you my football career because it can't be as important as what you want me to do. And he reminded me of why I even needed to be in football in the first place, which is to create impact to bring people to Christ rather than let me just be famous. Let me just be rich. Let me just go and score so many goals and achieve this and achieve that. And we see that as success. But ultimately, we are all wired and all created to want to feel like we've done something. And if we feel like we've done something, but we're still empty afterwards, have we really done something? So when we look at success, if I've earned 50 million in my lifetime, but I haven't done what my purpose is, even when I have that money, like we see Paul Gascoigne, Gary Speed, people like this, they get to that level, they achieve what they achieve, but because they haven't actually fulfilled purpose and they don't know what purpose is, after that, it's like, oh, 
they commit suicide or they have mental health problems or they get into alcohol and drugs yeah. because their idea of success was very societal. And society changes the idea of success every six months. So it's like, how do we keep up? We get into this performative lifestyle and that's why it's important to have a foundation of purpose in Christ mm. because it helps you to measure it by the word rather than by, well, at 25, if you haven't earned 5 million, you're not successful. At 30, if you're not a billionaire, you're not successful. How do we judge that if half of us aren't reaching it anyway? So that means nobody in the world is successful. But how did you get that revelation? It's just spending time in the word um, and spending time with God. And also, I think before God can really kick in in showing you who you are, you have to reach the end of yourself. And that's something that I did. I got injured in football and I was, I was angry with God, arguing with him. Oh. And I was saying to him, God, why am I injured? Like you, you wanted me to be a footballer, so why am I injured? And I got to the stage where I was like, if you don't want me to play football, just tell me. Mm. And that's when he reminded me that I'm frustrated because life has happened in football. And I'm now basing and judging my relationship with God on how successful I am in football. And this is something I teach people who are footballers, never ever judge how your relationship with God is going based on how well you're doing in football. Hmm. Because God doesn't control your manager. He doesn't yes. control your teammates. He doesn't control the fans. So if he did, then we'd all be puppets on a string mm. and it wouldn't be the world that we live in today. But he doesn't, which means that you can't say, oh, I'm not close to God because I didn't score this Saturday. Because if you do, then does that mean when you do score, you're close to God? Does that make sense? So for me, it was understanding that I could be playing phenomenally in football and be far from God in terms of my relationship with him, spending time with him, and I could not score and be close to God. So what do I judge it by? I judge them in different compartments. My relationship with God is my relationship with God, and I can bring him into football mm. because uh, Christianity is a faith that filters. Superb. Dan, with your young boy, uh, Knox, isn't it? How do you define success with him? And how do you raise him so he doesn't feel the pressure mm. of having to live up to someone else's kind of success? What, how do you tell him what success is? Yeah, because he's three years old. So first thing I'm going to do is get Ira's phone number and he's going to go and <laughs> yeah. live with him for a few years. Um, but he, he's hit the nail on the head, you know, when he's saying it's about impact, it's about purpose, not performance. And so, you know, I hope with Knox, he understands those things. But also, like, the culture puts on a, a time zone pressure on success. Like, you have to be married by a certain time, have a kid by a certain time, own your own house by a certain time, be in your dream career by a certain time. And if you don't hit those certain milestones, then that's it, you're a failure. Right. Um, but when you look at it, like, Milan is an hour ahead of London. If you're a professional footballer and you're 35, you're considered all right. Mm. But if you're a politician and you're 35, you're considered young. Huh. Um, Trump was 70 when he was president. Barack Obama was 55. Wow. So there's always going to be people ahead of you. There's always going to be people behind you. So the key that I want to tell Knox is don't compare yourself to anyone mm. else. Don't Great. compete with anyone else. Just find your God-given purpose by spending time with God, just like Ira just said, and then just enjoy life in your own time. Moses was 40 when he left Egypt. Then he was 80 when he led them to, out of uh, Egypt into the promised land like you know mm. 80 most people are written off by 80 but god does things in his own time so mm. i want god to do whatever he wants to do with mm. knox's life in in that time zone not my time zone yeah. and definitely not the word or the world or the culture's time zone fantastic what are you saying to the young boys that you're you're mentoring um, success in terms of success it's let's deal with success as a man first because I think that there's so many people in the world that really want to talk to you about your gifts, your talents, your skills, and oh, you're gonna be this, you're gonna be that, but nobody actually deals with character because you could be successful and you can get to the top, but if you have no character, you're not gonna last. And ultimately, my burden and my uh, desire is to train up biblical men in this generation because let's be honest, most men are skilled. Most men are talented. They've yeah. got something they're good at, whether they can speak, whether they can sing, whether they can dance, whether they're footballers, we're all gifted and we're all talented and that's the beauty of God that he gives us all individual gifts. However, who caters to the man themselves? Mm. Who caters to their emotions? Who caters to their actual purpose, not just their performative gift that they have? And I think that's something that I struggled with in the church mm. is that everybody wants to talk to me about, Ira, you're so good at speaking, you can preach, you can do this, you can sing, da, 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 da. And I'm struggling with stuff behind doors and nobody's talking to me about it. Wow. So I'm looking at these young guys and I'm thinking, you look at me as a role model. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm dealing with at this point in time. So I had to get to a place where I was just like, okay, well, God, you need to help me through this so I can help them through what they're going through. And for me, with all of my mentees, I've told them, I, I don't care about your gifts. I really don't. If you want somebody that's gonna train you in football, either come and pay me, don't be my mentee, or go and find somebody else. 
I'm dealing with you as a man. What are you yeah. struggling with? How can we get you out of that and get you into purpose? And we find that when you do that and when you focus on purpose, all of these other things actually end up being better than they were before. So for me, success is them being the man God has called them to be before they're the gift that God has called them to be. Amazing. Patrick, would you agree that vulnerability is an issue here when it comes to even us as fathers, young men, um, you know, just, just generally, we're not good at that, are we? No. And, and, and if we're, if we're going to have sensible conversations about what it's like to be a man, we've got to be vulnerable. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think Brene Brown did a load of research on this and, uh, and she said that the that actually courage and vulnerability are the same thing. So the Latin word for courage is cur. It means to speak your mind with your heart, to show up and let your true self be seen. And so if you hear someone um, talking about how they're feeling and, uh, you know, and expressing that, you don't go, oh, they're weak. You go, oh, they're quite courageous. And so I think it's about redefining our language around some of this sort of stuff. Right. That's really, really important. And, and you're right around success and, and why we should think about it. And for me, I think it's really important to say that I think success um, is about being vulnerable, but I also think it's about living by your values because your values are your priorities. Yes. So it's not just about achievement all the time. You know, I've got a daughter who's got additional needs and sometimes I think our language is all about achieve this, achieve that, achieve that. She will never get a GCSE, but she will in kindness <laughs> mm. and character and, uh, and teamwork and you know, integrity. And so I believe that we need to reframe the conversation a little bit around some of these terms that we use. Mm, that's superb. And what about the church world, Patrick? Um, I think we've got it wrong. Uh, Dan, you were a pastor, weren't you? I'm sure you're involved in church world. We've got it wrong on so many levels with young men uh, and even older men, look, just men in general, being vulnerable, being open, talking about things like mental health, success. How, are, how do we regain the ground and credibility so that we can say to people, it starts with knowing God, our Father? How important is that and how do we how do we position ourselves with some credibility to talk about that again? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the key thing for me is, again, it's about this creating safe and supportive spaces. It's about being non-judgmental. Um, we are so close to wanting to fix everything, aren't we? It's interesting, I was writing recently about the Good Samaritan story, and I was saying it's interesting, whenever anyone from the West sees the Good Samaritan story, we're always the Good Samaritan. We're always the rescuer. <laughs> and yes. I remember Sam Wells saying, well, maybe actually we're, we're the blind beggar. We're the, the guy on the ground who needs help. We're the one who pride needs to actually go, actually, I need to be served. And Jesus is the Good Samaritan. Jesus is the rescuer. And so for me, it's so important to keep on going, you know, it's not about who I'm becoming. It's about who I belong to. And, and I think it's like finding your identity in God and who God says and what God says over you. You know, if shame says two things, you're not enough and who do you think you are? Mm. Then actually God says the complete opposite. Mm. And it's tuning ourselves to that voice and communicating that heart. Listen, I think it'd be great if we could pray for everyone who's watching, because listen, we're all vulnerable and we all need all the help we can get. Would you kick us off, Dan? Yeah. And um, I want you all just to pray for whatever is on your heart. What's God saying to our viewers today? And um, I think that'd be a great way to um, round this chat up. Dan, would you, would you start? Yeah, sure. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for all the young people um, around the globe right now. And I, I specifically want to pray for the young people who um, are fatherless in this current season. Um, when um, Father's Day comes and for them, it's, it's, it's a hard day. It's a struggle. And Lord, I just pray more than ever that they will know you as their heavenly father, that they'll just be embraced by your grace and love and mercy and know that even if their earthly father maybe didn't treat them right, or even if their earthly father wasn't even present, that you will always treat them right and that you are always present. In your mighty name, amen. Yeah. Lord, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for this opportunity that we have to speak with your people. We want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for the ability to just hear it and be in an environment where we can be surrounded by people who speak wisdom, people who, who have our hearts on their minds, Lord. Mm -hmm. And we just want to thank you, Lord, for our character, Lord. We want to thank you that we will take the necessary steps, Lord, to just come to you, Lord, and submit ourselves to you, Lord, submit our character to you, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you are the best shaper of character, the word is the best shaper of character, Lord. And Lord, let us not be tossed and turned by every wind of doctrine that comes with society, Lord. But we just pray, Lord, that we will stay fixed on you. We will keep our eyes fixed on you and focused on you, Lord. And that we will do things in the process of your time, Lord. In God's time is the greatest time ever, Lord. Lord, let us not be rushed by society, Lord. But let us look to you for what your view of success is. What is your view of purpose in our lives, Lord? And let us walk in that and let us chase that, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Father God, I, I just pray for everyone that is listening to this. And I pray, God, that they would know that they're loved, um, whatever they've been through, Lord God, that whether they've been struggling, they realize that doesn't mean it makes them a failure, it means they're a human being. God, I pray that you would minister to them right now, your love, your heart, your Father's heart, God, and uh, that they would have the courage to be vulnerable. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so Lord, we hold our hands up and say, start with us. Start with us, Father. If we can impact those around us, Father God, for your glory, um, use us. God, we pray for everyone who's watching. We pray that this um, conversation has helped someone, opened up some conversations for you to come and do what you do best to make us whole. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.